Alrighty, the Holy Spirit, all of the series in that, I uh, wanted to also remind you, is available at mybelieverschurch.com. And so if you haven't had an opportunity to go out there uh, and see the YouTube channel, all the other content uh, and prior lessons, Pastor Mark will continue on with uh, lesson five, I believe, and the voice of the Holy Spirit, uh, which I've tied in and integrated. It's kind of interesting as we jump into the scripture here today. Uh, I have to say that uh, I was a little bit convicted a couple of Sundays ago when uh, all of a sudden Pastor Ryan stands up and says, yeah, we're going to do Ephesians 4. I'm going, really? You're, you're killing the, the, the concept and the content that I was looking to do. But honestly, uh, he did a wonderful job starting in Ephesians 4. And I'm going to have an opportunity to kind of put a bookend here on Ephesians 4 and really focus on living as the children of the light. And we're going to do a deep dive into Ephesians 4 and mainly at the back end there. So let's go ahead and start opening uh, in Scripture. This is the New Living Translation. <clears throat> With the Lord's authority, I say this, live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life. God gives because they have closed their minds and they've hardened their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasures and eagerly practicing every kind of impurity. But that isn't what you learned about Christ. Since you have heard about Jesus, you have learned the truth that comes from him. Throw off the old sinful nature and instead, uh, in your former way of life, which is corrupt by lust and deception, instead, let the Spirit renew you through your thoughts and attitudes. Put on a new nature created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. So stop telling lies. Let us tell other neighbors the truth, for we all are part of the same body and don't have sin letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. If you are a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good, hard work, and then be generous to, to others in need. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everyone you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. And do not bring sorrow to, the, to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, granting you, guaranteeing you that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as the type of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. Amen. 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 So today, what I've kind of just walking through the, the content, um, learning this verse, and specifically chapters 30 through 32, and applying that to just situations in life, I'm going to spend time uh, mainly in the NIV. I'll bring in a little bit of King James, uh, but kind of walking through this verse by verse and breaking down this case for you. And so on your worksheet, you'll be able to follow along just as uh, we do on our series here with the green check mark. You have an opportunity to kind of dig in with me here. And so really, as we look at this case against grief, the first thought comes out, and the thought ties into what uh, we've been talking through is initially in this uh, Holy Spirit lesson three, lesson four, kind of last week. I was talking to Pastor Mark, and he started bringing some Genesis in and said, you know, that this ties in really nicely. He goes, yeah, you know, I would encourage you to kind of think about how that fits in. So if we think about this, what was brought up in lesson four is the environment that we bring with us in life matters to God. That was a thought slash question last week. And I say, well, yes, how we live as humans and reflect the Holy Spirit in our daily lives, both in words and actions, declare we are God's, and when we align with God, nothing can remove his seal. So that's the premise as we jump into Ephesians 4, 30 through 32 here. So if we look back here at our scripture, and this is the NIV, as I said, kind of tying together a lot of pieces and parts to our case. So this one is, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God for which you have been sealed for the day of redemption. And get rid of all bitterness, rage, brawling, slander, 
and along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ forgave you. So we think through all of that, and we get into this, this whole piece and part where we go in and start to look at whom, and in the King James, uh, we go whereby, and we'll break down even as we get into unto versus onto, getting into the whole concept around the ceiling versus uh, some, some commentary on this is stamped. You look and go, is there a difference there? So let's start jumping into our case. Look at the word grief. And it's lepu in Greek. And the word is basically deep sorrow, endured pain, to affect with sadness, cause grief, throw into sorrow. You say, well, Paul's choosing some pretty interesting language here if we kind of go through and, and say, well, in the New Living Translation, we have sorrow, and in the King James, and in the NIV, and other uh, translations, we have grief. And the question becomes then, can we truly grieve the Holy Spirit? And if Paul's telling us in this first portion of our three chapters that we'll dig into the case on, is of course we can. You start to look in and, and, and look at that deep emotional response in that great loss. And, and your mindset, you kind of look and say, well, how, how might this happen as we walk through and, and have our path with, with God? And what is the actions and the things that we do ultimately going to cause that grief to the Holy Spirit? <clears throat> and we look here and we say, well, first off, if we're going to make a case, we have to have somebody or something that is impacted, right? So here we're telling you the Holy Spirit of God. Who? The Holy Spirit, right? And ultimately, as we move on to the latter part, in Christ Jesus. And so we have the, the Trinity here. We've got God, we've got the Holy Spirit, and we have Jesus that Paul's bringing together and saying, wait a minute, there's something here that your actions ultimately can, can uh, be just an offense to the Holy Spirit and to God, just as we may offend others, right? And you look at this new identity in our creation and who we are, and we stand there and we say, well, it's the indwelling of the Spirit. That's the start there to where we have to understand as we go in to this relationship with God and we go in and, and, and bring the Holy Spirit into our heart. It's ultimately as we're in Him, we establish our heart in a new creation, that identity in Christ. And you say, well, I know that as a believer. But making our case here, it's that indwelling of the Spirit as we look at the heart here kind of drawing you a picture, it's ultimately, it's coming down, and it's filling you up, right? You're indwelling. I have the, the, the Spirit in my heart. And as I'm there, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption, is that sealing and that Holy Spirit has come into my heart. And we look, we can't have living, breathing Spirit without what? The language of God. That was what we were talking about in Lesson 4. We think about confessing Jesus as, as, as our Lord and our Savior, and while he indwells, he's manifesting God's language in our heart. And what we do and where the Spirit reproduces is the life of Jesus upon salvation. And you say, well, what, what do we do with that? And I remember at a men's breakfast, um, which, no, no shameless plug here, there's one coming up this Saturday for anyone that uh, would like a good free breakfast, um, but ultimately, I remember talking to the guys and I said, it's kind of interesting when you stand there and you think about the tomb and where the heart can get hardened. And did, did Jesus put a doorknob on the tomb? You know, did he just step out and say, no, I want to step back in? No, he didn't. We don't have that hardening of the heart and treating the tomb as just a, 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 a cave that we can hang out in, a man cave, as I said, appropriate for, uh, for a men's breakfast. And thinking through how that spirit ultimately talks to your heart, how we let the Spirit communicate. Uh, Mama June, the first lesson for the Holy Spirit, had talked about the Holy Spirit and how her life was impacted by this. And so we really have to kind of understand this indwelling concept of the Spirit. And then we flip over and we start to think about, okay, the word seal. And I look through a lot of different versions and texts to make sure, okay, is, is, is this path I'm running down 
appropriate here, God? Is this really making sense? Does this work? And you think about the word sealed, and the seals given is sealed upon to, or <coughs> sealed onto the day of redemption. And so that's our King James. And we think the word onto is used to indicate something that was done, given to someone. And there's a clear difference here, and I was enamored when I kind of walked through and really dug in, is it doesn't say onto, which if you look here is meaning on top of. So we go into the concept of the seal, and for those that have done you know, biblical uh, history and, and, and other things, the seal was used often you know, out there. And, and even today, there's still uh, seals and, and other ways that, that officials use information. So our seal is used as an official seal in clay, an imprint. And what does it do is it carries the full authority of the legal office it represents. Amen. So no question, it's an indelible mark declaring royal ownership. So we look and say, okay, well, there's pain and death, and, and, and if we violate that, that, that mark, that seal, well, there could be a lot, a lot of uh, issues. But the big piece that I saw the difference here is kind of leaving you in this, this fourth bullet point is it leaves an embossed, raised impression. And you look, and, and it's incised with an image. So it's kind of walking through, and I'm like, whoa, whew. this one really kind of marks me here, God, as I think through and, and think about how the words are used and what Paul's message really is saying here is, is I found some uh, you know, communications out there um, from a commentary that, hey, it's stamped, you know, sealed, stamped, kind of traded as one, one is the same. And I'm like, no, no, wait a minute. From a stamp, you look, and it's, it's just, is, is this original? You know, I can be original in, in Jesus. I can be original with, with the Spirit. Uh, it's a signature and an emblem with ink on top of. Well, no, he didn't say that. He incised the heart. Just as Jesus took the pain, the suffering, and all of that at the cross, we look to say, okay, if I'm in, 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 incised by this imprint, this seal, it's something different. And what has that done to my heart? So we look back and we kind of look through different scripture and, and there's often throughout the, uh, the Old Testament, there's the use of these, these seals and I even looked for stamp in some of the, 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 the commentary and, and different, not often will we see stamped, we'd actually see sealed. And so I'm going, this is interesting, but a really nice story if you had the time to see it, I think uh, uh, Pastor Mark has talked about it a couple different times um, over different messages, but the, the story of Esther. And if you're familiar with that, we've got King Xerxes, we've got Esther, we've got Mordecai, we've got Haman, and ultimately the goal of Esther over a, 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 and the story basically is, hey, we're going to take out the Jewish people. And that's where King Xerxes and Haman are making a plan, right? They're going through this, and we look at the power of God that's revealed through the story, but to kind of keep track of where we are with this seal, we look at where this is brought up a couple of different times in Esther. And basically it's telling us, now you write to the Jews as you see fit. This is the first seal that was given. Is the, in the king's name, seal it for with the king's signature and signet ring for a decree which is written in the name of the king and sealed with the king's signature ring may not be revoked. And we think through this, and what happened is there's 129, I believe, 127, 129 different provinces from Egypt all the way to India. You think through that, and all of the work, it wasn't just one, like, hey, you know, today we can just pass it along digitally and, and send it along the internet. It had to get communicated, and it was communicated in different languages. So you just look behind the work of actually man behind this, and bringing a message forward across his entire kingdom that says, hey, go ahead and do what Hammond says, take them all out, right? But if you fast forward through the story, God works his miraculous power. And through Mordecai and Esther, we find that this same, almost exact same portion of scripture is found later on in Esther, where the message is now revoked. 
and walking through and saying, wait a minute, we're going to go through and instead of allowing the uh, Jewish people to die, they may take up arms and have no, no offense against anyone that takes offense to them. And this is sealed and this is declared. And it's rather interesting. A thought here is, if you know the story of Esther and have a moment to kind of walk through that, is you think about how all of this walks together and rather coincidental that often the events that we can have created by humans, right, ourselves, results in the worst devices scheme that can take someone out, right? In, in this instance, uh, uh, Hammond's working to take out the Jewish people through the power of King Xerxes, and we have Mordecai stepping in, and Mordecai is, is an individual that, you know, they're wanting to take him out. And ultimately by this, it can turn to be used and reveal the sin of the accuser, Hammond themselves. Sorry to break the story if you've never read it, but he's ultimately impaled on a pole that was meant for Mordecai. And so you walk through that and you say, even in the power in what's decreed through man, in this, this, uh, this whole usage of a stamp meant something. There was a grave authority there behind that, and everyone obeyed that law, that rule. So we fast forward here. Hopefully you're very familiar with this scripture and the story of what happens is basically we walk in and Jesus has died. He's, he's died on the cross and his body is given over uh, to Joseph and in terms of bringing him into the tomb. And they basically pick us up in Matthew 27, uh, verse 62 uh, through 66 there. And basically jumping in the next day on the Sabbath, the leading priests and the Pharisees went to see Pilate. They told him, Sir, we remember that the deceiver, this is Christ, once said, while he was still alive, after three days, I will what? Rise from the dead. So we request that you seal the tomb. And ultimately, we have that signet, that seal. Seal the tomb until the third day. This will we prevent his disciples from coming and stealing his body and then telling everyone he is raised from the dead. If that happens, we'll be worse off than we were at first. And we look through this, and, and it's kind of interesting how I need human authority. I need man and, and, and power and authority of government to come in and do something that ultimately we know God. Uh, we know what, what happens a few chapters later, right? Uh, ultimately, Pilate replied and said, take the guards, secure it the best you can. So I'm in the stand there going, well, I wonder, you know, he's reading that, and you go, did Pilate know something was going on? Like, hey, I'm just do what you got to do, right? No. Ultimately, so they sealed the tomb and posted the guards to protect it. And if we look through this and understand human authority, is the importance that the guards witness the sealing. So this was even an endeavor itself. It wasn't, hey, somebody just walked up, boom, let's seal the tomb, and we're good to go. This was an orderly process. They were responsible for what was sealed. So those guards were responsible for the body of Jesus, ultimately. <clears throat> we look through this and watching the Roman guards, watching this carefully is both their careers, their lives, uh, ultimately their lives, they were at stake. I mean, you die if you don't do what uh, ultimately you have to do, and if anything is broken there with that seal. Roman seal carried the legal authority <clears throat> to break a Roman seal was to defy human or Roman authority. And we come here and we look and we say, well, the tombstone was secured by all the authority of the Roman Empire. But what happened? It didn't stick, did it? it didn't stick at all. And so it's, it's really kind of interesting as we walk through this, uh, and, and we, we, we understand even in Acts 2.24, but God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life and the death that could not keep him in its grip. And amen, we know that even the seal of man, we look through it, there's something different if we're trying to make a case here of Ephesians 4.30, and really that whole point of not grieving this spirit, this, this grief that a living God can have, and ultimately coming through and, and sealing our, our peace there. So we look at this legal reasoning that we're trying to make a case here, and as we said, we've been sealed for that day of redemption. 
So we have proven whom, right, the actions were took place for, for ourselves and by the Holy Spirit. We have a purpose that the Holy Spirit is through and in us to the day of redemption. And there's a high degree of pain and sorrow here. You kind of look and go, well, well, why? So if we're trying to understand this, the question then becomes just why the case, right? Why the case? But even as we look at this, the most interesting piece is what Paul is, is trying to really get at with us is just the fundamental of, of, of Christianity is getting rid of sin. And this is really interesting how he lays even this out because you go, well, geez, that's kind of Christianity 101. It's, uh, I, I, I accept Jesus and he's my Lord and Savior and he you know he died for my sin and ultimately because of his death I've atoned and, and been renewed and I've, I've been given the Holy Spirit. But there's a lot more even as we dig into this and we start to look at the different words because Paul's message is fundamental to the basis of Christianity and understanding sin. And this really kind of hit, hits hard. This was a verse that, that, that just often kind of comes up in my heart, runs through and from 30 to 32 and just working through life, working through the things, seeing different issues and images that, that, that can occur out there, and we start to find that the depth of sin really sort of uh, inter intertwines here with what Paul's saying. And we come in, and, and, and our bitterness is the jelly and imp uh, jealousy and improper attitudes. It's dissatisfaction. So we, we go in, and, and there's multitudes of New, um, New Testament scripture that can tie into a lot of this, but uh, I found a few here in Acts 8.23, if you want to kind of write these next to your notes. And for I see that you are full of bitter jealousy and have been held captive by sin. And this is an interesting portion of Acts where uh, we walk through and, and the, the story uh, where Stephen and Paul are walking with, um, uh, you know, fellow believers. And uh, there's the Simon the sorcerer ultimately trying to come in and, and gain the power of the Holy Spirit. But he turns and says, no, wait a minute. Wait, there's something different about you. You've, you've got so much of, of a different mindset, uh, a different heart set here that uh, you, you, you're, you're not being uh, forthright. You're being held captive by your sin. And then we look and we say, well, well bitterness can turn into rage or rage can turn into bitterness. Uh, wrath and expression and violent, uncontrollable anger. And, and we jump into Psalm 37, 8, where refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Free not yourself, it tends only to evil. And we look in the third one here, in anger and wrath together, and you say, well, wait a minute, but Jesus was angry, right? He got angry in the church because they turned it into a marketplace. But ultimately what the Holy Spirit here is getting at is, is it uncontrolled? Is it something that ultimately is causing your demise or on the flip side, if we look at all of this inner twine and we stand in there and we understand the grieving Holy Spirit is may we not grieve others with our sin, with our anger, with our wrath, with our all of the other pieces and parts here. So anger with Roman 12, uh, 12, 19, Romans 12, 19 is dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God for the scripture says, I will take revenge I will repay the Lord back, or I will repay them back, the Lord says. And, uh, and, and through this, there's a lot of connectivity, even if we jump forward and uh, into some of the other sessions that we've done within Believers You around uh, Revelation and the whole uh, end of times coming through. <clears throat> to where brawling and clamor, we look and say, well, if I can't control my bitterness, rage, anger, well, then I'm going to get in and, and start being anxious, obnoxious riotous, troublemaking, it starts to impact others. Uh, I may be able to just be bitter myself and sitting here with just a root of bitterness. But as he kind of walks through this case, it gets intertwined, intertwined, intertwined. And we find here in Proverbs 22, 24, is don't befriend any angry people or associate with odd-tempered people. You know, this is one you, you pass on to the children in that. <clears throat> because irritations and annoyances can't always be avoided. There's, there's only so much that, that we kind of can walk through and limit when we look at how righteous anger can over, over uh, throw evil. Ultimately, if we can't control that, 
it turns around and starts to become uh, troublesome to others. And we shift in and he gets into slander, is speaking false evils about others. In Psalms 15, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. And we think through, you know, slander, and it's just so quick sometimes today, right? Even slander, you can go, well, maybe I need to bring it into 2021, and it's bullying. And you stand there and say, well, wait a minute. I mean, it, it's everywhere, <clears throat> and how things are, are, are brought forward. And we end with malice, just the implication of evil intent. <clears throat> Titus uh, 3, 2 through 6 says, they must not slander anyone and must avoid quarreling. Instead, they should be gentle and knowing true humility to everyone. Once we too were foolish and disobedient, we were mistake, misled and became the slaves to many in lust and pleasures. Other lives were full of evil and envy and we hated each other. But when God our Savior revealed his kindness and love, he saved us not because of our righteous things he had done, but because of his mercies. He washed our sins given us a new birth and a new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out his spirit <clears throat> upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hated one another. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us because the righteous things we have done were, not because, were because of his mercy. And so when it comes through to this sixth one with malice, we start to see that Paul is talking about different elements of us as humans. And he uses that number six. You look at this and you say, well, this is of us, of, of, of individuals. Could have thrown a seventh one in there. Could have just put five. Could have just said, hey, sin. You know, that, that's the basis here. But it all intertwines and it comes together in a thought really kind of had me thinking through, in, in order to get rid of all and enter freedom, we must experience God through seeking out the Holy Spirit and have a new perspective, both heart set and mindset. You may not have heard the word heart set, and that was uh, one that I've, I've used in different, different messages. And, and it really kind of becomes this whole pathway that walks through and makes us think, well, this Holy Spirit, this, um, this, this third part of the Trinity that I, I can get God, I can get Jesus, but this, this thing that is this breath and, and this life living inside me, how does this impact who I am and what I do each and every day? And, and that kind of comes through and says, well, get rid of all. It's really allowing us to say, can we walk into that freedom and understanding with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit inside us and with us, is what Paul's asking us to do is really understand, but because of the cross, there is no height nor depth, no length or breadth that's insurmountable. And that caught my attention last week. I was thinking through that and saying, you know, it, it's, it's really the play there on earlier in Ephesians, and we'll come to that in a little while in the conclusion, but thinking through and saying, Ultimately, it all just ties together. So making that case for the Holy Spirit and against grief, we stand there and say, well, wait a minute, we've, we've got the Trinity here. And truly, if, if an individual doesn't understand what the Holy Spirit means, Paul's trying to tile this back, get it into our world, our mindset, and even today, uh, what's applicable there. <clears throat> and freedom in our journey is so that I say in Galatians 5.16 here, is guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opportunity of what the sinful nature desires. For these two forces are constantly, what? Fighting each other, so that you are not free to carry out your good intentions. And so Paul later on is, is, is here in Galatians telling us that, hey, there's this battle that's brewing out there, right? That battle that we know is sin ultimately is battling in our mind and in, 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 in some in the heart. 
and how do we walk through that? How do we, we, we move through this? Well, we must learn that walking by the Spirit is being able to understand that there's a journey in freedom. And, you know, one of the, the pieces I'm going to walk through here a little bit and really tie in is where Blackaby, I don't know if you've ever read the, the, the book or, or gone through any of his studies, gets into the seven realities of, of God and experiencing God. And I think this parlays very nicely with what Paul's trying to get at here as we're trying to make our case and walk into the end of Ephesians here and, and being the light of God and his children. <clears throat> and so in experiencing God, you've got the, the pieces and parts. I didn't want to have to make you uh, write it all down, but you can follow along at the bottom of your sheet there. Is The first one is God is always at work around us. So we know God's there. He, he, he's, he's ultimately is God. We won't get into all of that, but a, another plug for this fall is if you really want to learn more about the beginning time and all of the fun things and who God is, Genesis uh, is the next uh, major topic that we'll be jumping on as we go through the fall uh, portion of Believer's You. <clears throat> but then we jump in and we've got the second piece here is a relationship. And that says, God pursues a continuous loving relationship with you that is real and personal. So, okay, that, that makes sense. We look through this and ultimately the invitation. He invites you to become involved with his work and in his work. And, and with that, we know that, well, wait a minute, this is a little different than maybe I've come to know Christ through redemption, this is a constant pathway for us, a constant opportunity for us to move forward. And we look through and, and God speaks. And God speaks through what? The Holy Spirit, through the Bible, through other people, through circumstances, and also through the church which is revealed through himself, his purposes and his ways. And we come to understand and know that as God speaks, this is really where it's kind of interesting, and I'm going to spend some time around this and the next couple here and tie this case uh, back to our case for Ephesians 4. And what happens with this crisis of belief is God's invitation for you to work with him, it always leads you to a crisis of belief that requires faith and action. And this is rather interesting as we tie this through to number six. <clears throat> You must make major adjustments in your life to join God in what he was doing, or what he is doing, not was, is doing. He's a living God. And then ultimately we get to this last piece of this journey that's constant. Is you come to know God by experiencing as you obey him and accomplish his work through you. And so this is not just one of us ultimately out there, right? We all own our 50 feet as we're, we're, we're given the opportunity here at Believers is it's tying together and it's being in, in, in purpose with God. And ultimately, it's, it's a constant cycle is what Blackaby gets at. It's a really fun, interesting study. Uh, if, if you uh, would, would like the information, I can certainly connect with me afterwards and give you a link and, and you can look it up out there or just uh, go Google <coughs> Experiencing God if you've not ever done this. And, and there's some good key information there, and it's very helpful. And, and some of it may be basic, but also there's a lot of bigger parts here that, that Blackaby is getting that. And where I wanted to focus some time and attention is taking a closer look at, at what's critical in understanding this adjustment. Is This is where we start to go in and say, wait a minute, this is where ultimately I come in and it's my mindset is my mindset that, oh, well, it's okay. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm just thinking bad thoughts or, or bad things. It's malicious. <clears throat> and ultimately, it's okay. You know, and, and I can come back here. I might, oh, you know, I believe in God. I'm back here in, in my crisis of belief. And what can happen is if that takes root, that bitterness even, if we, we tie to the first part of Ephesians 4, 31 um, there, in the bitterness and we start to say, well, what has God told you, right? You're not to be bitter. 
You are his. You're wonderfully made. You are God's. And walking through this and ultimately saying, well, our heart and our mind through the Holy Spirit is aligned back to obedience and experiencing God. Because if we constantly are in this mode of where we're grieving the Holy Spirit, we wonder in our circumstance, ultimately sitting there at, at, at step five, or even we go back to step four. Say, well, God, did, did God really say that? Did the Holy Spirit ultimately come down and touch me and say these things that ultimately allow me to continue on and, and be obedient and experience God? Or am I sitting in a mode to where I'm there wallowing and turning bitterness into anger and anger into wrath and at wrath into slander and malice in this constant cycle and wondering why am I not moving along? Why isn't God working? And that's a hard, hard uh, reality sometimes to be in. But then we look and we say, well, why are we here? You know, why are we a part of this as well as why are we a part of the Sunday services and other things? We're called to be there on others' path to where ultimately if they're in that fifth cycle is we need to help in the sixth cycle. And you look and say, well, wait a minute, adjustments. Number six, is there a coincidence that here we are to adjust? and be a part of each other's lives to where we can be obedient and there, God's number, number seven, be there along his path and doing the things that he's called us to do. <clears throat> Amen. So bigger is the question is how we allow the Holy Spirit to guide us so that we may do his work and ultimately bring the, the, the kingdom forward here on earth. <clears throat> and so we look at how the case continues in the spiritual outflow and as we go through the case, we started with what? The indwelling of the Spirit, right? Comes into my heart. I've got the indwelling of the Spirit. And then ultimately we say, and the infilling of the Spirit. Which if we look to the infilling, there's a lot of power here. As we establish the heart in a new creation and identity in Christ, but we say, a kind and be kind and compassionate to one another. This is verse 32. Forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. And this one is where we may stumble. We may be sitting there in the Indian position with our face down at step five in that crisis of belief and going, but wait a minute, no, stand up, pull up the bootstraps, because guess what? Through Christ, I've been forgiven. I'm a new creation, and ultimately, as I walk through this, I need to also be, what? Forgiving to others. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and we walk through this, again, is we cannot have the living, breathing spirit without the language of God. So we're back to understanding the Holy Spirit is that language of God in my heart. And when confessing Jesus as Lord and Savior, where the Spirit indwells, manifesting God's language in our hearts, where the Spirit reproduces the life of Jesus unto salvation, through now, this is where we pick up, the infilling of the Spirit, outpouring the power and boldness of Christ through us. And so our infilling now becomes the opportunity where we are baptized in the Holy Spirit and what happens is we are now vertically connected with Christ and God and ultimately can be horizontally connected with others. And I know that's been used out in different uh, messages and that. And it really catches my eyes because ultimately when you're there saying, wait a minute, I'm really vertically connected and now I'm horizontally connected. I have an opportunity to where what have I done? I've hopefully died to myself, joined this past. Maybe I've had a crisis of belief to where who I am. Well, that's good. That crisis of belief can go away because I'm not who I am. I'm ultimately a new creation in Christ Jesus where I can walk along and I can say, well, wait a minute. Now I may be obedient and, and adjust my path to where I can love others as Christ asked us to do and the greatest commandment there in knowing our forgiveness that flows through that. And so... Our prayer here this evening comes along from <clears throat> earlier in Ephesians 3, and we have to kind of consider against all of the, the evidence of the case against grief and where Paul lays this out, is he says, then Christ will make his home in your hearts 
as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down in God's love and keep you strong. And you may have the power to understand, as God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. And, and when I kind of looked through and said, well, wait a minute, we, we look through, and, and that's Paul's prayer to the church of Ephesus. Earlier on, and he's jumping in here in three, and then boom, later on in four, he's, he's getting into all of the cases that we've made. And we stand there and know that ultimately, if we can truly understand where God is in this whole big picture of our lives and the things that can happen out there, that ultimately it, it just boils down to his love. <clears throat> and so as we make closing arguments, and I've got two here, these are rather interesting, is we start, we've gone backwards in Ephesians to really start to look at the case and say, let's, let's close this case out in a mode to where we should not be grieving the Holy Spirit. And as we think now as Gentiles, and you also heard the truth and the good news that God saves you, and you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own, giving you what? The Holy Spirit, <clears throat> whom he has promised long ago. And the Spirit is God's guarantee. So here we are with the seal and that we're, we're given that guarantee in Ephesians 4 and all the bad things of life. Well, no, guess what? I've been guaranteed. <clears throat> and ultimately, he will what? Give us the inheritance he has promised and that he has purchased us. And to be his own people, he did this so that we would what? Praise and glorify him. And so we, we thank you early on as Paul opens up Ephesians. This opportunity later and we look at the, the woes of life and say, well, wait a minute, the woes of life just should be amongst us, right? No. The woes of life are connected there through the Holy Spirit, and, and, and we're grieving. We're, we're causing pain and sorrow to the Holy Spirit. And, and if we can't have a strong enough agreement with Ephesians 1, we look to Colossians. This is one of my favorite verses. And just knowing that in all things, if we have to kind of understand who Christ really is, and through God and the Holy Spirit in Christ, is that what? For all are in him, who's, who's what? In Jesus, all things were created. In God, all things he created. And things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and in him, for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. <clears throat> and we know this as we stand there maybe in these, these modes of crisis of belief or our adjustments or other things and doing, you know what, this just, he's not speaking at that step four. It's, it's not happening the way that I want this to happen. Well, we've been asked to join his work. We have to continue to forge ahead, join his work, allow the spirit to guide us, be there in dwelling in us and in filling in others in what's going to happen. Ultimately, we may not know or see until we get to eternity, but we realize that in life, all of the things that are held together are ultimately there through Christ. <clears throat> so what I'm asking you to do here as I come to a, a final close with the last couple of slides, I want to kind of look at this from what the beginning of, of that verse 4 and that section that we read in, in Ephesians is being children of the light. <clears throat> and I'm just going to ask you to close your eyes for a moment. I just want the room to be settled and clear. <clears throat> because what we have to look at here is, is thinking the journey as we move towards the beginning. And we move towards where we find the spirit hovering in Genesis 1. So, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the spirit of the living God was hovering over the waters. Now with your eyes closed, what does that spirit look like? The spirit's hovering over the deep. Can you see the spirit? Can you feel the spirit? 
And now open your eyes. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And that spirit spoke. And we look at that as the premier truth of God, the most precious moment of what our life and our path is all about is that light, that light. And, and, and I think of where I, I just gave a very high-level pitch to Mark about this, and he said, well, that light, I don't want to steal his thunder, but he goes, that light was on then day six where it was brought in and there for the purpose where it was brought in to give life to us through Adam, our lineage, and through Eve, and knowing that it was the breath, the ruha that we, we learned last week, was that was brought through, but because of the light, it all starts with the light. Yes. Yes. And we stand there and know that in all things, our lives can be shed by darkness, but we stand there and understand the light and that meaning of that light and an opportunity that that light ties to the Holy Spirit. And that light is ultimately the light that Christ said, wait a minute, through Paul here, you need to go live and be forward in the kingdom. Go, go bring forward my kingdom, my purpose here on earth. And so as we're called as children of the light, may we not bring and walk backwards and bring grief to the Holy Spirit because the purest form of light is who we need to ultimately look and know that it was that light that created everything and what was spoken of the Holy Spirit created the light and allowed us to now be in our path here with God, with God and that his light will shed out and kill any and all sin if we allow it to do so. <clears throat> and so what did God say? And the light was good. So we are good just as God said the light is good. So I close here and we'll, we'll end in a prayer. Is in our conclusion, we have to know that it's not only just a confession. It's the knowledge that our confession in Christ, we were sealed. Something different there. We were sealed. That's that incision. That's the part that we look through in the authority of the Holy Spirit that God in his spirit seeks what? Authenticity from us to carry forward his kingdom here. We think through that sealed again is, is the tender heart. That's what is in the King James. And you can't have a hardened heart. An incised heart is going to be tender. There's going to be wounds that you may have, but it's remaining with that tender heart. And when we go with God, our perspective must what? Change in both our mindset and our heart set. And we're called to make adjustments in order to live as children of the light. <clears throat> Amen. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, share this message today. I hope it provides you maybe some, some knowledge, some information, but I also ask that we're called to share the message, right? We're called to go out and spread the good news. And so for those that may have challenges in life, the bitterness, the sin, the things that, that can occur, uh, is, is hopefully the message here allows an opportunity for you to see the word just a little differently, to understand that the transformation that Paul had in his life and the Holy Spirit and how he impacted him uh, through Paul and all of the other disciples and apostles is that our word from beginning to end is all of God and all there for us, and we thank you for that. So let's close in prayer. <clears throat> we thank you, Heavenly Father, for today. We thank you for the words that you've given to us, and we thank you for uh, <clears throat> all of those that showed up here. We just ask, Lord, that you reach down and touch each individual in their minds and have the appropriate mindset for you and also the heart set that you've uh, given the opportunity for us to have through that relationship with Christ. We ask that you give guidance and protection as we go out and travel and bring forth your kingdom. We thank you for all of the things that you've given to us and you will only continue to do because your promises are yes and always and amen. We thank you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us on the Believer's Church YouTube channel. If you would like more information about Believer's Church, you can visit mybelieverschurch.com. 
If there is anything that you need prayer for, please email us at amen at mybelieverschurch.com. Be sure to check back next week for a brand new message. 